Sarah is my co-host today in a <laughs> sense because she's been with Squadron and Sisters for how long? Nine years probably. And has walked through so much in terms of healing her marriage and dealing with difficult situations in marriage and becoming, I think, a lot stronger, if I can say that, in your relationship with the Lord. And so perfect person to be sharing the 12 essentials in a wife's toolbox for marriage. And we're going to just get to this first six today. You'll have to wait till next week to get the other six tools. <laughs> but let's just jump right into this, okay? So tool number one. Make Jesus your number one relationship so that you are secure and centered. Mm. Secure and centered. Because we're going to need God as our strong foundation when the storms hit. And I don't know about you, but it seems like for me, storms are hitting pretty much nonstop. I mean, there might be a lull, but boom, then another storm, right? Definitely. Especially in this oh. season. Yes. With all that's going on in our world and people getting laid off and kids being home and and all the economic stuff going on, it's just like wave after wave after wave. And in your marriage, unless someone, I mean, is living the true fairy tale, which I don't think is possible, you're gonna have waves in your marriage too. Mm -hmm. I uh, was kind of disconcerted when I first figured out that, you know, marriage would not be a constant honeymoon experience. Anyone else kind of be like, what? <laughs> Jump back. I thought I married pretty much Jesus here, and so I don't know what the problem is. And so, yeah, there are going to be those ebbs and flows in marriage where you're disappointed with your husband. And so we have to have Jesus as our primary relationship, and that causes us to be so secure and centered that even when things go wrong in our marriage, mm -hmm. we don't completely fall apart. We're able to rebound and be resilient, right? We want to share the verse that goes with this one? Yeah, Psalms 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Mm, I love that. I love that. I love God is our rock, our fortress. And if we really press into him, we are going to have that security even when we hit bumps in the road, right? And one little um, little benefit, added benefit to this business of becoming a more secure, confident woman is men find a woman's confidence very attractive. Mm -hmm. When you carry yourself with this kind of um, invisible, I mean, it's not like you've got a, something, a sign on your forehead saying, I'm confident, treat me well. But, but when you carry yourself with this confidence and kind of self-respect, most men will treat you much better. Yeah. And I would say another just added benefit of this when we have Jesus as our number one relationship, it takes pressure off of our husband. There's nothing more unattractive than this like clingy, needy yes. woman who who's like, you're my everything and and, and just globs onto this guy. And, and they're like, like, rings him dry. I yeah. got to get all of my love from you. I'm going to ring you dry until I get every last drop of I mean, love. He's like trying to come up and gulp for air because you're <laughs> suffocating him. Yes. That is not what a guy wants. That is just, you know, setting up for codependency and smothering a guy to death. Yeah. So this also just kind of takes mm -hmm. that pressure off your husband because he nobody needs that kind no. of pressure. No. Right? Yeah. And so how do, let's talk about how do we become more secure, more centered? What does that look like for in your life? Because I know you are really so strong in the Lord now, but you might not have always been that way. So what has been instrumental for you moving forward in developing this really strong relationship with God? I think there are several things. I think it's just having that steadfast, like I am going to spend time with God. I'm gonna put all my eggs in that basket. When something gets tough, there's no pulling back. It's like you make the choice that you are all in, yeah. right? Yes. Like when something bad happens, I don't go, oh, God, you left me. I, I I thought you were with me. I thought you said you'd never leave me nor forsake me, but you're just a liar and, and I can't trust you. No, we are all in with Christ. Like, you know, it, it's it's all or nothing. And so when the waves come, when the storms come, it's like, okay, God, you're with me. What are we going to do? Help me. Give yeah. me the strength to make it through this. It's mm -hmm. not. And before I'd say before when I was a strong Christian, I would blame God Ooh. or I would just be like, okay. And I would just sw step away from God mm. and kind of go do my own bad stuff away mm. from God and in the world. Um, so yeah, yeah. The, uh, but spending that time with him. Um, what does that look like when you say spend time with him? Because, you know, sometimes I know women are like, what does that even mean really spend time with him? 
Well, last night, I'll just be honest. Last night, I, I have a really bad back problem that's going on right now with my spine. Um, I couldn't sleep half the night. I was tossing and turning in bed, so I got up. I didn't want to keep my husband awake about 3 a.m. And I'm like crying, terrible pain, can't sleep, I'm exhausted. And I just grabbed my phone and I put Psalms on. I started in Psalms 23. Nice. I took some medication to kind of help ease the pain. And I dozed off a couple times. And um, early this morning, I think I was up to Psalms 108. Wow. And <laughs> I mean, all throughout the night. And, and you know, I kind of get hard on myself because I'm in the word, but I'm not one of those people that can tell you the addresses, right? It's hard. Uh, but Psalms have been one of the things that have made me just stay steadfast in the Lord when trouble comes it it just reminds me that okay there may be a storm yeah there may be something really tough going on you may be crying out to God but he's faithful he's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. he's good he's not gonna leave you and it just kind of reminds me of that and it's funny all throughout these Psalms I was like mm -hmm. man I think this is Psalms 91 mm -hmm. and then boom it'd be like Psalms 92 and then I would start yeah. saying it so it was just really like those are the time that's what I'm talking about is we're not gonna just turn to something else and turn on TV and numb out but we're gonna seek God even in those tough moments yes. we're gonna choose to press into him even when most people in the world like would Joe be like why don't you just curse God and move on yeah right no we're gonna press in even deeper yes um, because he is our all-in-all all. he's right. our everlasting right he's our stronghold he's our mm -hmm. salvation mm -hmm. Absolutely. he's it that's right <laughs> and for me kind of similar but um, in the storms of life we do have that moment where we either run away from God mm -hmm. because we're just mad at Him and feel like we, He can't be trusted, or we just press into Him. And I've chosen to just press into Him. I call it like just stubbornly pressing in, just stubbornly believing that His promises are true. And I, I think He delights in that. I think He delights in that. And I often sense that He just responds to the, the next prayer that I pray when I'm just saying, I'm running toward you. I'm not gonna let the enemy you know, get in between us. Um, so sometimes it's that stubborn, persistence to just continue choosing God. Um, but also something that's worked for me, worked for me, maybe that's not the right way to say it, but that, that has helped me draw closer to the Lord and trust Him even more, is I started praying, and this is probably, I'm gonna say maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, I've lost track. I started praying very specifically. Hmm. I started praying big, hairy, audacious prayers. Hmm. And because I prayed so specifically and in faith that God is loving and all powerful, and as long as this is inside or alongside His will, then it's going to happen. I just had that kind of faith. Yeah. I just saw God answering so many prayers that that just, I mean, talk about growing close to the Lord. How can you not fall in love with the Lord mm -hmm. when He's answering all these prayers and in crazy, incredible ways? So I would just encourage you, listener, if you have something. Not that you're going to win the lottery. Sometimes that's not exactly <laughs> in line with God's will. But, but you know, some of those specific prayers, not the kind of prayer that's like, oh, be with Joe. You know, <laughs> how would you know if God answered that prayer? Be with Joe. It's, you know, there's, we pray these vague prayers sometimes. Yeah. You would never even know if God answered them. Yeah. But if you say, Lord, you know that our rent is, you know, $1,200, and we only have $850. We need $350 more. So can you find a way to get us $350 in 10 days or whatever? See how specific that is? Mm -hmm. And Lord, I'm trusting in you. I've done all that I can to, to, to do whatever I can to get the money, but we are short. And this is exactly what we need. I think when you pray those specific prayers, it just delights God because then he knows that when it comes forth, you will know it's him because mm -hmm. it was so specific, right? And, and then you fall in love with him and then you want to pray more and it's like a snowball effect. Well, I think too, God's like knows that we have so much faith mm. when we're willing to pray really specific yes. prayers or when we're willing, when we feel a nudge from the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to step mm -hmm. out and do what he's calling us to do, mm -hmm. even if it seems crazy yes. or unwise. Yes. So, yeah. so right now I feel a nudge to pray for Sarah's back. Oh. <laughs> I felt that as she was talking about her back problem, and I've prayed before, and many people have prayed for your back, but I sense God just say, pray now, pray now. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to pray now. <laughs> In this era of social distancing, is it okay if I put my hand on your back, or is that illegal? Will the police come to our door? Okay. You better just wash your hands when we're done with I the podcast. I better wash my hands, and I'm not going to touch my face. Okay. Here we go. Lord, 
I just think it would delight you to heal Sarah in this moment to relieve her of this chronic back pain that has been debilitating for so many months, Lord. And so we just come before you with total faith, knowing that you delight in doing good things for your children and giving good gifts to your children. And so, Lord, we're asking right now that you would heal Sarah completely and forevermore for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Tell us the results <laughs> later. Okay, we better move on to number two here. Yeah. Look at the team. We get the two of us together, and that's why we had to break this lesson in two. Okay. Uh, number two yeah. is to be respectful and honoring toward your husband. Men need this like air. Like, they cannot function and survive and live without respect. That's right. It, oh. it is pivotal. It is foundational in your marriage. If you want your marriage to be healthy and thriving and you're a man to be a man, we have to show them respect. Um, I remember one uh, woman who came years ago and she hasn't been coming recently, but I remember her saying that um, she didn't really show her husband respect. She kind of talked down to him and she linked it to the fact that he never like stood up and asked for a raise. He had been with a company for many, many, many years, but he just stayed at the same level and never got raises. And she made this connection in her mind that she thought it was because he didn't feel respected or like he was could stand up and actually say hey this is what i'm worth i want this and so i i thought that was very interesting yeah. that respecting our husbands actually give them like a taller backbone and yeah. and gives them courage to to yes. kind of step out and do things for god to step out in the workplace i've been encouraging my husband for years to witness to men at work and God just keeps bringing one guy at a time mm. each season where my husband gets to pour into him nice. and so uh, those are the ways mm. right we want to respect them and honor them so they feel like they have something to give yes uh, it, it just it, it gives them more courage um, Ephesians 5 33 says the wife must respect her husband this is like God's commanding you to respect your husband. But wait a minute, I don't feel any respect. <laughs> How many of you are thinking that right now? But I don't feel any respect, so I don't respect him, so I can't be respectful. Mm. Well, we're just going to preach at you right now <laughs> because we have learned that respect that God is talking about here is not a feeling. Mm -mm. It is not a feeling. Nope. It is a choice to act respectfully, to mm -hmm. behave in a respectful, honoring way toward your husband. So that means even if your husband has grossly disappointed you. And we've all experienced that, have we not? Amen. <laughs> Maybe multiple times in one day. Remember, they're not Jesus, they're not perfect. Good men, but not perfect. So in those moments, even when we're disappointed, I have learned that it is possible to still be respectful mm -hmm. in my tone of voice. Yep. Now I can be setting boundaries and everything and I can be saying that is not okay what you just did or you need to get help for this particular problem. I can be saying all sorts of firm things and setting boundaries, but I can still say it in a voice that can, communicates love, respect, honor. I can avoid rolling my eyes. This has taken me many years <laughs> to, try to, to try to stop rolling my eyes. <laughs> Honestly, sometimes I will turn around so my husband can't see, roll my eyes with God and then turn back again. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a work in progress myself. Anyway, um, but it means not being all sarcastic. You know how sometimes you can shred your husband with sarcasm mm -hmm. and, it, and he might even laugh, but it's not really funny. Um, there are so many ways that we can be disrespectful, but some of the ways that we can be respectful and honoring would be to listen to your husband when he's talking and not finish his sentences, Debbie Chavez. I'm working on that too. Um, to, to listen when he's talking, to not interrupt, um, also to ask his opinion, like maybe he has a valid opinion mm -hmm. other than yours. What? But <laughs> this is respectful to say, well, how would you like to, um, how would you like to our schooling to proceed for our kids? What does that look like for you? Uh, are they in too many activities or not enough activities? Uh, what do you think is the most important thing about the cleanliness of our house, which is the most important room for you to come home and, and find that room is tidy. Mm -hmm. And then actually listening to his opinion, a man all of a sudden feels like, wow, you can almost sense that they just stand up taller mm -hmm. when you show them that respect. Yeah. Any other ideas yeah. there? Um, 
like you said, when he says something, do it. And and it can be little things. Like there was a season we did the Dave Ramsey program and my husband would say, okay, I did this, I did this, but I need you to go pay this bill. And do it. When they ask you to do something like that, show them the respect mm -hmm. of, of, of having follow through and actually doing what they say. Also, another way to show, res well, not to show respect, but to make it right. There's been times in my life that I've made a mistake and um, wasn't comfortable with the decision my husband was going to make and we always talk things through and at the end of the day He has the final say he's the leader of our family and he has the final say of what unless he's leading you off a cliff Yes, unless yes. he's leading yeah. us off a cliff or something yeah. right submit to your husband as is fitting in the Lord Yeah um, But there was something that I just really wasn't comfortable with it was a big financial decision and he knew I told him I, I will not be happy. I don't have peace. I don't want you to do this and I never usually say it that firmly But God actually convicted my heart and I had to go back to my husband a month or two later and tell him I trust you that you've that you've penciled out our finances that you know We can afford this that this is something God's directing you to do and if you want to do this I, I'm I I fully support you doing this and please forgive me mm -hmm. for not supporting you and standing beside you wow. because that was portraying to him that I didn't trust him. I yeah. didn't believe in him. And that, that is not respectful at yeah. all. So if you're, I just want to encourage someone, if you're in a spot right now where you know you've done something that was disrespectful to your husband, you can make it right. Yes. Like there's no time like now to have that difficult conversation with your husband and apologize and, and, and um, support beautiful. him. To be, to be humble and to be able to apologize is a gift also for your husband. Well, let's move to number three here. Carve out time for weekly dates mm -hmm. and purposely discuss your expectations and desires in many areas of life so that you begin to truly understand each other's often unspoken expectations. Because one of the things I've learned is we all enter marriage with these unspoken expectations. Mm -hmm. We just kind of feel like they're going to think and believe everything the way we do. and so. For instance, they might have been raised in a in a marriage or in a family where they spent no money at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. And your family spent boatloads of money at Christmas time because that's really important to your family. And so you just assume that of course he'll do it your way because that's the right way, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> My way is always right. I don't know about anybody else. And so all of a sudden there's this huge argument because his vision of Christmas is different than your version of Christmas. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to discuss these things. And what better way to do it than when you're not in the heat of the battle, yeah. discuss it ahead of time at a date night. And so we have this research. Well, first of all, here's the verse that goes with this. It's Ephesians 4.25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. And you might think, what does that verse have to do with anything? Being truthful with mm. your husband. Instead of having all these unspoken, hidden expectations, yeah. expecting him to be a mind reader and come into agreement on, with you on things that he knows, he doesn't know what you're thinking. So you're being truthful and saying, actually, I never wanted to live in the city. I wanted to live in the country. Mm. And he's like, what? You know, so you've got to discuss these things, right? So Definitely. we have a resource. You want to show him our little resource? You can print it on the Squadron of Sisters website. It looks yeah. like this. Go, ladies. Yes. <laughs> so this is um, on squadronofsisters.com. Click on the free resources tab and you'll see a little PDF that you can print off that says unlocking your heart's desires and expectations. And so there's a whole list of like, I don't know, 30 different areas that you can discuss with your husband. The first one is strategically placed in first place on the list because it's <laughs> the word sex. And we thought this would get your husband's attention. Say, yeah, I'm willing to talk about this on date night. <laughs> I'll be I'll be willing every week to talk about these things. Oh, romance is on the list. Ooh, affection. Ooh, I like a some lot of, this. of miscellaneous things that you might think. What's that on there for? But a lot of these were born out of us doing marriage uh, counseling with couples and finding them arguing about all sorts of things. And so why not discuss these things ahead of time? Even things like health and fitness is on the list. You would be surprised. I've sat in marriage counseling sessions with another couple where she is like an exercise fanatic and he's put on about 50 pounds, he's a couch potato. And they can get in a rip-roaring argument about how important health is, it's her number one priority, his is about 35 and number 35. <laughs> and, and they just needed to talk it out and say, yeah. where can we compromise? Where can we come together on this? And, and as a family unit kind of decide this is 
this is where we're going to come to agreement. Mm -hmm. So yeah, talk it out. Yeah, and you gave this to us at a marriage retreat that we had done several years back. And we just had time to go off with our husbands and go through some of these. And my husband and I had been married many, many years by then. And I was completely shocked when we yes. talked about certain things, you know, yes. like even romance and sex, like yeah. how often do, yeah. does your spouse expect it? We think guys want it like every minute of the day <laughs> when really maybe two or three times a week is enough. But so it, it's just so amazing when we when we when we open up and pour into these because when we do this when we're not in an argument we can cover so much more ground yes. and our husbands are so much more willing to open up about these things. Right. This I would say is one of the most pivotal moments I remember oh, awesome. of intimacy, like deep um, intimacy with my husband. Not yeah. obviously not sexual yeah, yeah, intimacy, yeah. emotional yes. intimacy of just um, yeah. figuring out, you know. And this just we. It, it helped us set goals of how we want to put God first in our yes. life and, and do reading the Bible together every day. It, it, it totally changed and everything. One of the reasons it works so well is because you're discussing it when you're not already in the argument about mm -hmm. that issue. You're discussing it proactively when you two are getting along on a date night. Mm -hmm. Like, well, what are your thoughts about how much time should be spent on recreation and hobbies? A lot of arguments born about that. You know, he wants to go five nights a week. You never expected that to be part of your marriage, you know? And so these things just need to be discussed when you're not in the heat of the argument. So we highly recommend that resource, squadronofsisters.com. Click on the free resources tab and you'll find that PDF. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. let's get to number four. Number four, carve out time to build a vibrant, healthy, robust sex life with your husband and allow yourself to actually enjoy having sex with your husband. What? To enjoy it? <laughs> they know if you don't. They know if you're just like <laughs> marking it off like a check on your list of things that you needed to get done that day. They know the difference. They do. Just saying. <laughs> God's uh, perfect plan for your marriage is for you guys to be sexually active. It's like a gift, a treasure inside of marriage. Um, and very bonding. It's hugely bonding when yeah. you are that intimate and vulnerable with someone. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, this is, you know, your husband didn't marry you just so he could have a roommate because then he could have just had a roommate. He <laughs> married you for a, the fringe benefits of a roommate, right? So yeah. it's like, okay, this is part of why you got married. Yeah, and, and I would just say when you have a, a healthy, robust sex life, there, there's hormones that are released, oxytocin, these cuddle hormones, they bond you and your husband together. And I don't know, it just, it's like magic dust. I don't believe in magic, but it, it just causes like you to be more light and happy and kind of let things go more. And you know, that verse that talks about um, your husband being intoxicated with yes. your love. It, it's almost like, you're both intoxicated because it just keeps you in love and intrigued with each other yes. when you have that vibrant, robust sex yes. life. You want right? to read the verse that goes with it? Yeah, so 1 Corinthians 7, starting in verse 4, says, For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may be that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Yeah. So, and we know, um, and we know from personal experience that often women have a lot of issues mm -hmm. that can pre prevent you from having this robust sex life with your husband. Both of us were sexually abused as children. That's, yeah. that's part of our story. And boy, that leaves um, kind of a permanent scar. Let's just be honest. And it was hard to work through all of that. We've mm -hmm. both worked through that. I've seen a counselor. You've seen a counselor. We've tried to really work on these things. So, so if you have something in the way of that vibrant sex life, we just urge you to to look into what help there might be. Often, honestly, for moms, it's that they're worn out. Mm, they're yeah. exhausted. It's like, and now he wants something from me. You know? <laughs> have you ever felt like it? I know some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, now he wants something. Oh. I just don't want anyone else to touch me or need anything from me at all. It was worse, I think, when you were. I was nursing. Oh yeah, and, that's really and bad. Anthony it's was like, really stay wrong. away. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, but but there are even practical things you can do with that. Like one of the easiest things you could do, and most men are willing, is to say, "Honey, sweetheart, I would love to be there for you tonight. You know, put on my sexy lingerie for you, or whatever. But I need you to get the kids in bed, to make the lunches for the next day, to put the dishes in the dishwasher, all those like evening chores, mm -hmm. and then I'll be waiting for you in bed. And ten to one, when you put it that way, 
he will be Johnny on the spot getting those things done. <laughs> and you do get to then shh, relax, yeah. which for most women, we really can't engage very well sexually if we can't you know, relax. And, and what is it about the chores that are left undone? If there are <laughs> chores left undone, can anyone, can any woman actually enjoy sex? You're like, okay, what am I gonna get the dishes in the dishwasher? <laughs> Right? Okay, maybe it's just me. Anyway. <laughs> well, and, and not just seeing a counselor if maybe you have some issues, but find ways to spice things up. My husband and I this year will have been married 15 years. Ooh. So, I mean, you have to keep it alive. It can't yeah. just be the same mundane thing over yeah. and over again. So, you know, maybe you find something that is sexy that makes you feel comfortable. Light some candles, put some rose petals out, maybe get a babysitter. And yes. when your husband gets home, I've done this before, where I had rose petals through the the house with a trail to the bedroom mm -hmm. where I was yes but we don't need any more details <laughs> ready <laughs> no details but you know th there's all sorts of creative things yeah. that you can do to have fun you know well that leads right into our next point number five be intentional about playing together with your husband mm. have fun together this is also really bonding mm -hmm. when you laugh with your husband about something you'll be surprised how a month or two or even a years. two years later something will come up that reminds you of that and you'll start laughing together and it's very very bonding mm -hmm. so play together you know find those times where you can go out and you can try a new sport that you guys have never tried before and you are terrible at it but it's like you can <laughs> laugh right maybe you have that big pillow fight or marshmallow fight oh We've done that that is so fun just get a big bag of fluffy marshmallows and have a marshmallow war together um if yep. you're just alone you could do it just the two of you we've done it with our son it is a hoot we'll find marshmallows for weeks <laughs> but here's the tip i'm just going to give you the tip you can only throw them at each other the first day. Because after the, that, they get hard. They get really hard, and then it's not fun. Not fun. Then That's it hurts. Fun. <laughs> so the verse that goes with this is Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. So let's keep that playful, mm -hmm. that playfulness going on. And that also involves being kind of flirty with your husbands, being kind of sassy. You did that when you were dating, probably. So continue flirting with him. And let's get to number six. <laughs> Stop expecting your husband to be perfect. He's not, he never will be and neither are you. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and notice something good in him each and every day and actually tell him, verbalize it. Don't just think it in your mind. A lot of times I'm guilty of this where my husband will be off to work and I'm like, oh, thank goodness he made my tea before he left. Well, text him. Yeah. Call him. Thank you for making Thank the you. Tea. Put a note in his lunchbox the night before, yeah. encouraging him, telling him how awesome he is. Um, mail him a letter at work, Ooh. a little note. In the mail, like with a stamp? <gasps> what? <laughs> Jump back. <laughs> I know, right? Um, yeah, so this is encouraging to him. It also reminds you that he does have good qualities because mm. there's going to be, he's not perfect. There's going to be days that he does something or says something and just ticks you off. And when we are pointing those things out every single day, we're like the good things, the good things. Yeah. We're reminding our mind he is good. He has good qualities. God didn't make a mistake when he made this man. He placed us together intentionally. He has a plan and a purpose for us together yes. for my husband and it, it kind of helps you get out of those humps when maybe it's not such a great moment yeah right this is philippians 4 8 finally brothers and sisters whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy think about such things so we're just going to remind you and i have to do this myself because i'll get into those little snits where it's like I'm noticing everything about my husband that's bothering me and I'll start to make the list in my mind. Does anyone else do this? Kind of start making the list and then there's that and then there's that. And I have to like turn it around by saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's the devil egging me on. Mm -hmm. So I have to flip the script and say, wait a minute, my husband has good qualities and I'm gonna start listing them in my mind right now. And in a matter of moments, I'm my attitude is completely shifted around. Mm -hmm. I'm now reminded of the good qualities he has and ladies, Trust me, your husband does have some good qualities. I know some of you are thinking, nope, not my husband. But yes, there are some good qualities for sure. Start reminding yourself of those qualities and share that with your husband because mm -hmm. that will be hugely encouraging that you notice, even though he's maybe failed in some areas, that you've noticed some things that are good about him too that will really build him up and encourage him. Mm -hmm. That is the first half 
of the 12 essentials in a wife's toolbox for marriage. So next week, we'll get into the second half. <laughs> Can't wait to see you guys then. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>